Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today I have Isa Watson of Squad coming to us from a rainy New York day. How's your day going? So far, so good outside of the rain outside. I wish it was sunshine, but can't complain. Yeah, well, but soon you'll be in, it's June as we're recording this, soon you'll be in the sweltering, you know, August New York. New York is like crazy in the bowels of summer. Yeah, it's super crazy. (laughs) Are you a native New Yorker or are you from around there? I am not. I'm from St. Kitts, actually. Um, And I spent most of my childhood in middle high school in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So Wow. Yeah. St. Kitts is part, it's in the Caribbean. Where, where is it? Um, it's part of what chain or it's its own independent island? So it's a British colony. Um, it was colonized by the Brits a while ago. It's, um, it's about 20 miles south of St. Bart, if you know where St. Bart is, down there in the southern part of the islands. That's awesome. I will need to check it out on the map. I'm going... Just to humble brag, I'm going to BVI's next week for family vacation, summer vacation. I'm so excited. (laughs) Sounds like a great vacation. (laughs) I hope so. Hoping no tornadoes pass through and, you know, disrupt it all. So I'm excited. Trying to get my kids into sailing. So that's my my goal with this. (laughs) Um, Well, very cool. Tell me, what is Squad? What do you guys do? So Squad is two things. One is a community, an exclusive community, and two is an invite-only app. And the problem that we're solving is that Gen Z and millennials are yearning for in real life connection um, and opportunities to meet people and forge you know, relationships offline. But it's just so hard to do this in the digital age. And so what Squad does is it curates a series of offline events mm. Um, Squad does, Squad's members curate events, and also we have a number of brand partners that do as well. And every time you you attend an experience with someone, they're unlocked in your digital community. So you can access their profile and message them, et cetera. But what Squad does is it mimics building relationships in real life. Interesting. It's interesting response to a trend, you know, I don't know if anyone would have predicted with just the rise of everyone glued to their smartphones and you hear these stories about gen, you know, the younger folks like having terrible social skills because they don't interact live. Um, It's true. Did you, how did you come up with this idea? Did you sort of see that problem festering or did you experience this yourself or what's the the backstory? I saw the problem festering, you know, I just, I, we had this really interesting, we just created a community in New York one day and we said, we're going to call it squad. And you know, we just had like different events, like different panels and different like things ways for people to get together. And that community just took off so significantly and in a way that was like so abnormally fast. And we, so I started to dig a bit deeper into that. I said, who are these people and why are you coming? And I started to spend more time with the, you know, the members of the community. And it turned out that the average person was 26 years old in New York. They were college educated and they thought that they had, you know, great social media, but like could not find a mechanism to build real life relationships and wanted to do, do just that. And so we said, wow, this is super interesting. Let's build technology around it and make it super scalable because this isn't a New York City thing. This is a thing that, you know, is impacting you know, the millions and millions, hundreds of millions of millennials and Gen Z's everywhere. And so um, essentially that was how we discovered it. And now we're just planning to scale it. We're starting with New York City, but we are, we're, since our launch, uh, we've been getting constant requests from like Berlin and Tel Aviv and London and LA. And so there's so much demand for what we're doing. Yeah, no, I definitely think you're tapping into a, a need and, and kind of a latent uh, demand is it how is it scalable though and when I think of in real life things that seems to be difficult to scale so how does this scale 
it's scalable and not too dissimilar from how Meetup was scalable, right? Sure. It's, it's scalable, not too dissimilar how, you know, Facebook groups is scalable. And so, you know, with Squad, the one thing that we do is, you know, the difference between like Meetup and Facebook groups where there's no guideline on what exactly is a Meetup experience or what exactly is a Facebook group experience in real life. We do have, you know, different guidelines on what exactly a good squad event is. And so mm -hmm. when we first enter a market, we actually curate 100% of the events. And a few months later, we actually start opening it up. And then when members actually um, want to put on events, there's a cap for a number of events in each market. And so only the best event experiences get selected. And we're starting to learn different um, language and different you know, indicators that make a good event. So, you know, from a machine learning perspective, we can just automate the approvals down the road. And so um, it's really scalable from, you know, kind of decentralizing the event creation process. Sure. Interesting. And do, the, do most events have a, a certain theme or topic? I mean, is it, you know, meet up to discuss Bitcoin's price or something? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, or what? What's the yeah theme? So most of the event experiences on the platform have some type of human topic. So for instance, um, you know, they range, event experiences range from dinner series to improv series to yoga in the park to pick up basketball. And for instance, like our dinner series, there was one that happened that this one specific one happened a few weeks ago and the former chairman and CEO of Etsy led a conversation discussion on resilience. Mm. Um, personal and professional resilience. And so cool. the one thing that we do with Squad is we actually try to keep the conversation human. And we actually, in the app, when the event is happening, it goes into live status. And in life, the live status, you'll see the run-up show. So you'll see the series of questions that you should be, that, you know, should be guiding conversations that you're having, you know, the different parts of the agenda, et cetera. And so that really helps to not ha go into some someplace and the first thing that someone asks you is what do you do mm, sure who are your vc backers you know and so um <laughs> that's essentially kind of the flavor of the different types of event experiences and we're also expanding especially with like some of our brand partners so that actually segues into my next question i was going to ask when you go you know the focus is getting people together in real life I was going to ask, do you make everyone put their phones away or lock them up in a Ziploc bag during the event so people aren't on the phones? Or but it sounds like the app is actually part of the event as it's happening, right? Yeah, exactly. We can't completely like take people away from their phones. <laughs> so um, we said, how do we blend digital in the way that people actually interact with apps and interact with their phone with, you know, having a really good in-person event experience? And so like, there's a series of push notifications through the app and also like a few text messages that come through that help, you know, kind of trigger certain things in the event experience. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah, I definitely, I feel like there's also a, a kind of a gap left by meetup now that meetup has been acquired and meetup seems just stale and outdated anyway. I don't know. I hope yeah. no one from meetup is listening, but um, you know, it was starting <laughs> to get a, uh, I, I think I unsubscribed from everything I was getting from Meetup because it was like too much stuff and it was just a bad experience. So I feel like there's almost a gap left by by Meetup's wake, you know. So anyway. Um, there's a huge experience and actually one of the things, one of the pieces of feedback that we got from our users. Um, so I, I told you our average user is 26, 26.3 on paper. Mm -hmm. And um, the feedback that we got was that they came to New York and they actually tried Meetup first. And they found that, a, they said the people in crowds and meetup were like significantly older. And B, they felt no guidance at the event and there was a lot of inconsistent quality. They would go to an event and show up and be like, okay, what do I do? Who do I talk to, you know? And so that was really hard for them as well. And so that's part of the experience that we're trying to solve through that. And that's why that's helpful. Yeah, interesting. Cool. I find myself now, like I went to an event yesterday called Startup Conference and it was fun to get out of the house, go down to Computer History Museum. But like I spend so much time in the office, just heads down cranking that now I kind of look for an event every other week just to sort of get out of my own 
headspace, you know? <laughs> so yeah. anyway, I'm outside your target demographic age <laughs> a little bit, but, um, only by like a year or two, <laughs> a year or two, not much. My kids will be on it soon. So how much have you guys raised and over how many rounds? So we've done a three and a half million dollar seed round. Um, and we'll likely do our series A and either at this point, like early 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and so our seed round was led by Harrison Metal. Uh, the part of there is Michael Deering. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Harrison Metal, they were some of the earliest institutional capital into brands like Birchbox, Heroku, Harry's. Um, they're based in San Francisco. We had pretty strong participation from Charles Hudson Precursor Ventures, mm -hmm. also in San Francisco. Um, and then the New Voices Fund, actually, which is a, a Unilever fund um, that's actually based in New York. And so those were our three big institutional investors in that round. Cool. That sounds like a good, good uh, combo. I've met Charles once or twice. I think I've had him on a panel. He's, he's, I like what he's doing. He seems to really be yeah. building a good brand for Precursor. Yeah. Um, very interesting. So talk about putting this round together. I think in the notes um, from Janelle, you meant, she mentioned you had like 150 meetings or some very large number. Talk about sort of building the funnel and getting this whole thing, you know, going. So the funny thing about that 150 or so, it was probably more like 200 plus meetings that I had with people in Silicon Valley or to get up to Silicon Valley, um, is that that was over two years of just trying to build my credibility as a founder. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of put some of the earliest capital into the business myself um, with the help of my family and I, despite the fact that I went to MIT, despite the fact that I managed a billion dollar product, you know, at JP Morgan Chase and even built a huge digital product, um, I was still a Silicon Valley outsider. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that people have the perception sometimes that like, oh, you know, just because I went to Harvard, just because I went to Princeton or any of the, any of the top schools means that you can automatically go and, and be in. Um, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of, uh, credibility building. And so that's what I was doing for a few years before we actually did our official seed round. Yeah. But by the time that I did it, like my reputation had preceded me um, enough and there was like enough familiarity with me. No, this is great topic. So let's talk about that credibility building. I mean, you're, you know, talk about cracking Silicon Valley. So what did you do? Like literally, were you flying out here trying to set up coffee meetings? You know, give us the actual kind of play by play. Yeah, so I, I was out there quite a bit, um, and I never, I never had a meeting that was a cold meeting. And I think that, you know, it's, it's a t cold outreach is a, is a tactic that I see a lot of founders using, um, whereas I would argue that the more effective introduction comes from someone who knows someone, right? And the way that you get funded is that someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone and they're all referring you to like the next three people to talk to yep. and it becomes like a street branch and then have a network that's growing in a multiplicative fashion and so um it actually started with some of my roots in north carolina you know um one of my investors is this guy named stephen aldridge and he was one of the earliest employees at intuit he was one of the um, earliest, he was actually the chief product officer at GoDaddy at the time. Mm. And Steven from Chapel Hill and, you know, his dad's a professor there, where I'm from, but he lives out in Silicon Valley. And, was, and so it was con consistently making connections like that. And then Steven would introduce me to three other people. And then those three people Steven introduced me to, they would introduce introduced me to another two people and that's essentially how I got the ball rolling it wasn't all coffees like sometimes I would take do calls and things like that um but that is that's like it was just like a, a really hard hustle and grind head down for two years let's talk about that sort of branch tree metaphor which I think is interesting so you would you know this is sort of laying the groundwork building the credibility even before fundraising so what were you doing were you saying hey i'd love to just tell you about my idea and get feedback were you um tease you know kind of teasing a future uh funding round or what was your sort of like approach to all these people and how would you 
get them to introduce you to three more? Because I think that's not always intuitive how to do that, right? So I think that people always say when you want money, ask for advice. If you want advice, ask for money, you know? And so there's this like really weird reverse psychological thing that goes on when we talk about money as humans. And so um, I would actually even research. So there was, a, there was a few things that I would do. I would research kind of who are the people that I need to know yeah. um, to build a really good product, right? Um, who are people I need to know to really help me with like distribution or kind of growth marketing? And so what I would do is I would say, when I would get the introduction to Steven, for instance, I said, hey, his background is in product. He's such a great senior product leader. Say, hey, listen, these are the specific things that I really want to talk to you about on product. And I would be specific. Like I have very specific questions for you. Because a lot of people have the approach of, hey, can I pick your brain? Yeah. I don't have time for you to pick my brain. Like, yeah. what, what do you want? <laughs> and so I think being super explicit in the ask and how um, you'll spend their time and their brain space is super important. And then I will say, let's use Stephen because I'm still talking about him. I mean, with Stephen and say, you know what? Um, this was super helpful. I really appreciate it. These are a few of the other things that are top of mind for me. Who would you recommend that, that I speak with? And then he would be like, oh, my friend Susan, my friend Bob, my friend Mike. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want me to, how about I send you a forwardable email for Susan, Bob, and Mike that you can use? Would that work? Okay, great. I can, and then I can look out for those intros like sometime this week. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. And so that is how I maintain that. And I, keep in mind, like, once you have an with people, it's not just like a one and done. We'll come back to these people say, hey, Stephen, I did meet with, you know, Susan, Mike, and Bob, and they were so helpful. This is what they said, and this is, you know, the outcome of that. Because once people know that they're helpful, they'll help you even more. Mm. So there, it's like it's really, really like intense relationship management, and it's something that people with the highest IQ, EQs, EQs do best. And I feel like founders, we're stuck in like IQ land, <laughs> you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so that was dialing it back up. You know, I would kind of identify my needs. I would make specific asks. Is this is why I want to meet with you specifically. Can you meet with me? Um, and then I would make sure to explicitly ask if they did not offer for three other intros um, for people that could be helpful, that would want, that would be excited about what we're doing. All that stuff is just so precise and actionable and I think contains so much good wisdom and advice because I think I love this sort of being very specific about what you want to talk to people about because I get you know we have a lot of startups on founder screen I get people asking if they can set up a chat and like what is it about if you don't have a very clear agenda of what you need it drives me crazy I don't want to just chat I mean maybe if we're out socially but that's you know something different so I love that spe specificity and then I love this concept of following up and kind of reporting back the outcome that's no one right. does that and that's huge <laughs> right well, yeah. and I'll tell you how that also man that how that works in real life I followed up with Stephen actually for years and then he has a buddy who's a very high net worth individual at a private equity firm who works at a private equity firm and he was asking Stephen like what, what company should I invest in and Stephen was like oh easy like you should totally talk to Isaac and then that guy threw in a bunch of money and so like when you just reiterate that point of like when you keep people involved and let them know that you they've helped you 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 remain top of mind like if you don't stay out there it's easy to fall you know by the wayside absolutely yeah great this is just golden so let's talk about you know you spent the time and effort and I applaud you for that, laying the groundwork. Now, how do you flip it into actually getting people to write you checks? How, did you just one day say, all right, I've, I'm, you tell me. I don't want to put words in your mouth. So I said, all right, we need to raise money to bring this to the next level. Um, and you, as a founder, like you, you generally know when you need to raise money. You don't want to ever, you want to try not to get below like three, three months cash ever. So you six to nine months, 10 months cash out, whatever, there's, there's a time to raise and there's certain cycles of different businesses. So he said, all right, it's time to raise. So I, I like identify what I call is my quarterback. 
for fundraising. My quarterback was Charles Hudson from Precursor Ventures. And Charles had invested a small amount of money at that time, um, but like he was actually gonna help me like get my seat done. And so um, what Charles did is he was the person that I was mainly going to for feedback when I said, okay, this is the deck that I'm putting together. This is the story, right? And that was iterative for about a month. Once I said, once I made the decision, I'm going out to raise. And one thing that Charles has, Charles tells me, and I've heard him tell a lot of other people, is that fundraising, you're, you're likely only going to be successful if it's your core focus at that time. So it's not something that you can do passively um, and passively, you know, very well. And so essentially what Charles said is, all right, I'm going to introduce you to five initial VCs. Like we're going to make a list of like 35 target seed VCs. We did that. We're going to introduce you to five VCs first. And those are like your kind of not first choice ones. And we're going to see what the feedback is. And the market is going to tell you if you're ready to raise or not. Mm. And so in those first five meetings, I, I think got two, like one or two complete like dings, like we're not interested in this, like mm. et cetera, et cetera. And then three of them, I made it to partner meeting. And so for people who, um, you know, don't, aren't familiar with the VC fundraising process, Generally speaking, um, whether you're talking to an associate or, you know, partner, there's a, there's some type of consensus that needs to happen about like, do we fund you and just the partners to be involved. And so, um, I was getting introduced to partners. I was for the most part, not getting introduced to associates. And that was like something that I bypassed on purpose for efficiency yep. reasons. But I, like, I made it to like kind of general partner meetings for three of those. So I went back, took that data, um, went back to Charles. And I said, this is what, you know, had he, he heard feedback on his own and he said, okay, based on this feedback, you're ready. So let's now do like 10 intros and like, let's like get like all these meetings done in like a few weeks. And so I started those conversations at the, in the beginning of February, right? Mm -hmm. um, I got down to end of March and that's when I met Michael. And one thing that, kept happening in my fundraising conversations was that there were a number of VCs that said, we'll participate and we'll throw in cash, but what is needed is a lead. Yeah. But mm -hmm. the lead sets the terms, the lead kind of, you know, carries the flag um, for the company in this round. And I think that that's a, that's a mistake that a lot of founders make. They don't explicitly say, okay, will you lead? And, um, I actually had a mm -hmm. worksheet. I had an air table where I kept track of all the feedback that people um, was giving me, was giving to me. I kept track of like, if they said they would lead or they wouldn't lead mm -hmm. things like their foot size. And over time it's super important to do this. I think because the first piece of feedback that I got was my, that my market was too small. And I'm like, no, the market is freaking huge. And even Charles was like, no, your market's huge. And he was like, that tells me that you're not telling the story right. And so because that was like the biggest chunk of feedback, I said, okay, um, let's, let's address how I'm telling the story, change that. And then that feedback went away. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. um, so I, I would say two things. Like it's really important to be kind of process oriented, capturing feedback, very diligent, like make sure that you can try to get as many warm intros as you can um, and make sure that fundraising is super iterative and you're going to continue to change things. And yeah. then, if you're lucky, like I was in this process, then like, if you have Charles, someone like a Charles as a quarterback or whoever it is, it can be like, you know, Susan, um, having a quarterback who is in that ecosystem is incredibly helpful. Yeah. And, and so Charles, Charles had made a small investment uh, yeah. before becoming quarterback. And, and yeah, that is super helpful. And then did he come in and, um, Double yeah. down on the yeah, he came in and then double down around in that and, round. I mean, he does have a venture fund, so did he not want to lead? I guess it's awesome he was a quarterback, but like, why wouldn't you get him to lead, or you just wanted someone else to lead? Charles, Charles doesn't have the size fund to lead a seed round. 
So if we're doing, you know, three and a half million dollar rounds, you're, you're looking at someone to lead who has a 60, 70 plus million dollar fund. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's kind of, you know, where Charles's sweet spot is like pre-seed even, and, and he sure. describes it this way as well, where his checks are, you know, like 100K or so, whereas, you know, our lead, your lead is generally putting down 50% of the round. Um, well, not always, but, you know, in, in seeds, I feel like they do. Yeah. Okay. So you're out there getting a lot of people who are interested in following, and then you, you meet Michael of Harrison Metal, and then he says, I'll lead. And then you got everyone else, or did you try and find a couple leads to kind of compete for the for the position of lead? Yeah. Yeah. So you know, the funny thing about it is that I think a lot of founders, I hear a lot of founders talk about the name of the firm, whether it's like Sequoia or Excel, you know, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. For me, it's always been about. I'm fortunate because Harrison Metal has like a superb reputation, but aside from Harrison Metal's reputation, my priority was finding a lead investor, like person, like homo sapien, that I felt I could trust. Mm -hmm. Sure. And because the reality is that like in the trench, in the trenches, this person's like important, like you need to make sure that they're a true partner to you. And so I met with Michael. Um, Michael, I met with him for an eight o'clock breakfast. Michael is an early bird. And we had a really good conversation. He completely understood what we were doing, thought it was like a good, um, you know, good investment opportunity. And like initially said, he would get back to me, made him a user on the platform so he could explore a little bit. And then he, he came back and quickly said, like, I'll invest. Um, and so I think that the funny, the funny thing about it is that when I, when I look at the conversations that I've had with VCs, you as a founder when you looking back know in like the first five minutes if this person is going to invest or not yeah. and people will drown you asking for all this diligence with no intention to invest um especially like when it's like stage inappropriate diligence mm. at a seed you're not your cac is so irrelevant at mm -hmm. a seed your ltv what is that you know <laughs> so um and so, you know, within the, like Michael and I, you know, we hit it off. He was super smart, super kind and very committed to his founders. And so that's when I said, okay, he gave me a term sheet. Um, and then I got a few other term sheets and I was like, I'm going with Michael. And then I filled up the round, but it's funny because it took me deliberately being on the market for fundraising, like two months, two and a half months to get that yes from Michael that term sheet and then before that I had no cash really committed yep. and then like in a few days of just letting people know I had a term sheet for three million dollars now I have like six million dollars on the table and I was like wait where were y'all before yeah, like, right. <laughs> like, like VCs are such followers <laughs> it's so true it's so true it's that I, I've said it like where it's like 80% of the time is to get that lead. 20% is filling out the rest and your numbers are even more skewed, right? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it's exactly. true. It's true. And which makes you respect the folks like Michael or with our, in our case at Founder Suite, we had John Frankel at um, FFVC. It makes you really respect the guys and gals who will take that, that lead position and sort of, you know, yeah. take the leap of faith. It really is a big deal. It sets them apart. Really interesting. Okay. Um, was there anything else to it? Once you, so it sounds like you filled it out pretty quick. So I guess you were sort of oversubscribed a little bit. Did you, um, Super oversubscribed. yeah. So how did you winnow it down and pick who to let in? To be honest with you, I think it's a combination of things. Um, first is like, value add and trust mm -hmm. do i feel like you could add value did i feel like i had the right assortment of value right i may need some i maybe want someone in there who's really strong at product may want someone who's really strong at growth strong at marketing whatever i think the second thing um one thing that founders really really underestimate is is this person fundamentally a good human being mm -hmm. and so i also kind of went with the people that i also i felt the most comfortable with the people who um who I felt like 
I could trust based on my interactions with them. Um, and then also people who, you know, were just supportive along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people, when you have a name like Michael Deering on your cap table, all sorts of people show up trying to get involved, right? And because Michael commands that level of respect mm. in the, the valley. And so, but there are people who were like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with you. Total pass. Don't even want to meet with you. And then they heard Michael was involved. They're like, oh, actually, can we meet? No, we can't actually. <laughs> um, so, sure. so, I, so I just think that like that trust, um, the value, the value add. And I think that is super important for founders to remember that an investor is coming onto your cap table, not their firm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Did you do a lot of, you know, in sort of assessing who you can trust and who's a good, a good person, was it a lot of gut feel or did you do a lot of back checking and reference checking and, or, or both? So it was, it was actually both. So it's definitely like my initial gut. I'm like, Ooh, I really don't, I don't feel good about this person. Let me, let me double check and do some back channel or it's like, actually this person seemed really cool. Like let me double check and do some back channel make some, make sure I'm not missing anything. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely both. It was back channeling. It was um, like, even, you know, I had, I looked at the companies that they had invested in and saw what kind of activity to any of the founders that they had invested in. And I found those founders and I said, yo, give it to me straight. Like founders will give it to you super straight. Yeah. I, I found out some things like there were investors were out. They were like, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> don't awesome. Do <laughs> and then there were invest. I mean, other founders where they were like, Oh no, this person is super great. And they would tell me stories. They would say, you know, I went through this like really contentious, like co-founder split and like they were actually really supportive and came in and did this or, you know, had a really bad departure, um, mm -hmm. a really bad investor situation. They came in and did this. And so those, those, those stories of how investors have showed up for their founders, th mm -hmm. that, that was like the most powerful thing for me. That's super great. Yeah. Good advice. Did you do a priced round or a, a safe or a note? I did a price round. Yeah. Any, anything notable about just the negotiations or terms that you want to share? Or if not, we can. Skip. I would say it's not that nothing, nothing super notable about the terms, except that, you know, I had asked, I think it's super important for people to ask what, what what's the average valuation on like an A now or a C now, or like to find out how many like, you know, valuation, data points you can get. And we, we fell like really within the range, like very strongly within the range of like where we were supposed to be. And I think that, that I need it because I feel like there are people that could have maybe valued us too low. Um, and so I think that made me feel comfortable. And I actually, some people have the, you know, strategy of just endlessly negotiating and just like negotiating like things that they're fine with. Yeah. I actually was very like, you know, comfortable with where Michael came in. And so I didn't even really bother too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's, that's a good sign, right? If they're being fair with evaluation in terms, that's a good starting point for this marriage you're embarking on. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, totally. If you're starting off with a contentious foot, that's always a little unnerving. Um, any tips or advice for um, persons of color trying to crack into the venture world or Silicon Valley that we haven't covered? And we've covered a lot already, but anything else you want to, you know, pointers you want to give? So I think that for POCs um, and even women, I think that, you know, that networking component matters a lot more because your credibility bar is lower initially. Mm. Um, I always joke and say that, man, if I were a 22 year old white dude from Stanford who like dropped out my last year, like I would have been raised like $40 million. Um, but another thing too is that, and I see this a lot with women. I see it with like people of color too, who, who are, they, they know that they're constantly trying to prove something um, and like trying to show proof points. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we get that the com we don't convey that the right way. The way that we really need to convey things is through a very strong story. Mm -hmm. And this is where I went wrong when I first, in my earlier stages of like 
be in her shoes, Silicon Valley. I would come in, I'm a scientist by training, right? I'm mm-hmm. a chemist. And so I would come in and I would say, hi, my name is Isa. I like to tell you about this. And this is the data. And this is why it's so compelling, like because of this data. And that's, that's actually, it seems good logically, like it's good, it's logic brain, but it's totally the wrong approach with these, you know, guys and gals who really want a compelling story because they're mm-hmm. emotional beings too. They want to feel excited by something. And so I think that's a place where I went wrong and learned lessons. And now I even prioritize like how I tell stories. And I think that storytelling is even more important, like the more minority boxes that you check. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, no, that's good advice. Anything else you would do differently if you were starting this all over again? Um, anything else I'd do differently if I was starting it all over again? Um, I think when I first started, I had too many cooks in the kitchen. Mm. I, I quickly narrowed down to Charles, <laughs> but I was list everybody and their mother and their grandma and their cousin has an opinion about what you should do, and what your approach should be. And at the end of the day, like all the opinions aren't going to be the same and align. And so um, I, I think that is really important to kind of limit, like just limit it to a few people that are working with you in the fundraising process explicitly. And they're so tempting to go out and ask so many people for advice. And so I feel like I was spinning my wheels um, and just spinning my head with like all the different types of advice I was given. A lot of it was like opposite advice, right? And yeah. I was like, what right. do I do? <laughs> so um i think that's one thing just kind of limiting the people that you have in this process with you which is a little bit counterintuitive but i think it, it helps get you focused and more effective i was having this conversation yesterday with a founder and the same thing it's like it's both a blessing and a curse when you're out talking to 100 or 200 investors all these people are smart successful they have opinions so it's a great like you know, opportunity to gather ideas and feedback. But like you just said, a lot of times they're totally conflicting <laughs> bits yeah. of feedback. So it can be, can make your head spin a, a, a little bit. Right. So. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, just a few more questions will be done, but um, what do you, th- you mentioned you're thinking about doing a series a in uh, 2020. So how are you sort of thinking ahead towards that? What do you think you're, you need to have in place to raise that a how are you planning for it now yeah Yeah. so there are a number of um you know actually i I met with michael a few weeks ago and we came you know to agreement with some okrs for me to make sure that we're focused the right way um to achieve the milestones to to get to the a but i think the a is really raised on momentum and story like I've talked to so many founders now I've talked to so many like VCs and people will tell you that your CAC needs to be this. So you need to have 1.1 million, one, one to 1.5 in ARR or this thousands level number of users. But the reality is that I have a friend who raised a $16 million a pre product and like a $30 million B pre product. And then I also have friends that raise, you know, A's on $5 million of revenue. And so, you know, one of the things that we're, you know, doing to really focus and make sure that we are successful um, in raising the A is making sure that we understand the fundamental dynamics and components of our business drivers. Understanding the fundamental dynamics of the business, I think, is super critical um, to the A. And I think most Series A's are raised on um, momentum and you know, we are growing in revenue, we're growing in users and we're very consistent, but making sure that we understand those dynamics and like have a great story to tell um, behind that and have very strong organic growth, that's going to be the driver of our A. And I, I think I said this before, but it's not, you know, to my understanding, like, you know, based on my friends who have done A's and B's and C's and, you know, BC's, there's not this like, rubric of this CAC and this rep this ARR and this number of users. Um, and so I think that for us, that's what we uh, need to do. And, and lucky for us, we are in a business and a segment that is timely mm-hmm. where people are starting to talk about this a lot more. People are looking for solutions. And so we're also trying to kind of capitalize on that early mover advantage that we have. Yeah. What do you think your 
almost envisioning your your slide deck for the A. You don't have to give me numbers, but what do you think your key metrics will be that you'd be putting out there? Is it number of cities or users or some combo or what else? No, we're going to focus in New York City first. There, there's 8 million people that live here, right? <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, one of the things I've learned from a lot of other uh, market-based type of companies, like whether it be like Guilt Cities or, you know, car, used car sales, um, et cetera, uh, is that when you grow cities too fast and you don't fully understand the dynamics of a market, that actually drains you more than it helps you. And so we're definitely going to be focused on New York City first, but our, you know, some of the things that we are going to be focused on is, like I said, that like super organic user growth. Like we haven't really had, um, we haven't really invested like much into marketing. We've been growing a lot through referrals um, of people in the application, right? Um, yeah. Also the growth in our business model and making sure that's super sustainable. But, you know, overall, when I talk about this, you know, what squad is doing, bringing people together in real life. I say that we're the social media 2.0 revolution. You know, there is, okay, let's get us online. And now we're just like so glued online that we're like sick of being online all the time. And we yeah. actually have to kind of attend to our human needs, um, which, which includes like just getting to know people. Yeah, no, I love it. It's social networking 2.0 two is offline. It's, it's kind of a fun. Exactly. So here's a tiny little story. Yeah. I was in um, with my brother and my cousin and a friend. We went on a motorcycle trip up in Canada, way just off into the woods. And we went to this little town called Bamsfield, which you can only get there by dirt roads. There's a few hundred people there, but we're hanging out at the, the cafe and there's like some young people that live there. I'm like, what do you guys do for fun around here? And they're like, we don't have, the cell coverage isn't good enough. Like no one has cell coverage. So they like meet up at this cafe and then like spontaneously go figure out what to do that day for fun, right? They're not texting and tweeting and, and, and social yeah. networking each other. They're doing it all in real life. So it's a very, it's a microcosm of what you're doing on a yeah. much larger scale. But it was really cool to hear just these guys describing it like that. I'm like, wow, that's like taking me back to my youth. <laughs> so, um, very cool. Well, uh, this is good stuff. Um, I wish you luck for your Series A. And of course, you should replace the Airtable with Founder Suite because we've got like 40,000 funds in the database and the CRM. So, because we use Founder Suite, my primary use case for Founder Suite has actually been my investor updates. Oh, which yeah. Is super great for that. Um, and it was just like, yeah. So, we actually, I am a customer of Founder Suite. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I know we, uh, we've had some interactions in the past. Um, well, this is great. If people want to learn more, it's simply withyoursquad.com. And is it yeah. open or they're applying to? You can apply. We, we automate, we automate um, entrance to the platform. If you get two referrals, um, your phone number is referred twice by two members. You, you automatically get in. And we text you your code to get in. Um, otherwise, we also do take applications. We just have thousands of applications at this point. So um, we've been prioritizing like getting in through referrals. You maybe don't want to say this, but do you know what your next city will be beyond New York? Or have you not uh, figured that out yet? I would say contenders are Los Angeles, Chicago, Toronto. Mm. Um, the funny thing about New York is that New York has a lot of people, but the people, I, I, I call it the flakiness score. New York has a high flakiness score. Of, you, you have like 100 people RSVP and six people show up. Whereas in Chicago, they're, they're more high commitment. So mm. they say they're RSVP and like 98 people will show up out of 100. Um, and so what we're looking to do is actually go into, we're looking to really kill it in New York, which we are, and we've been doing like so well, and I'm so grateful. And we want to actually go capitalize on some of those less flaky cities. Yeah, that's interesting. The flakiness. That's a great, you're going to get PR for that, right? Media coverage for like your flakiness index of different cities. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> San Francisco is probably pretty high on that, I would, I would think. It feels like it. I don't know. San Francisco's flaky and the way to bring people out is to have like Jack Dorsey or Mark Benioff do something. It's very like tech and, you know, Silicon Valley oriented. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I said, I've, taken enough of your time this is fantastic lots of really really good practical pieces here um thank you so much and uh i wish you success we'll talk great. to you after your series a <laughs> great thank you nathan bye bye